So how do you feel about Java Go? I understand this is a strange thing to ask, especially at GopherCon, when everyone is hang hungry before the lunch. But you are here because we have something in common. I'm pretty sure most of you started their programming careers with some other object-oriented language like C Sharp or Java. <laughs> no? <laughs> but who likes Java? <laughs> 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 Uh, for me, it's been my first love. But man, I saw my love doing some stuff that made me think. I shouldn't come, uh, forget about the clicker. What I was missing was the passion and, and the love for the art. Have you ever met a developer being really passionate about their job at some random insurance company? So I got curious about Go. And I was attracted by the following two facts. A, Uh, the community looks so fun and passionate about what they're doing. And the iconic mascot, the gopher, everywhere, tells me that stuff doesn't have to be that serious all the time. And B, a simple and expressive approach to programming. I'm a simple man, and I can't handle any multi-threading or voodoo in my brain. And I appreciate if I can just read what's going on in front of me. But bef before we continue, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Martin. I'm a developer with about f a bit more than five years of experience. In my previous career as an electrician, I was debugging dome-making machines and deploying flight simulators worldwide, luckily not at the same time. Um, since last year, I'm employed at Posido in Vienna. I'm trying really hard to get them annoyed with me, with my random ideas, but they still support me with kind of everything I do. And as soon as AI is taking our jobs, I'm going to become an international cat sitter full time. Um, I wrote big parts of this talk in a cafe in Paris. And if, you want, if your cat wants to hear more about Go, give me a call. So one day, I was listening to the Backend Banter podcast. This is where I learned about the term Java Go for the very first time, when Maria Peterson went on how Java Go is the worst, head to head with Ruby Go. And I was hooked right away, because Java Go, this sounds exactly what I would do. So I started investigating, and around the time we did lightning talks at work. And I asked my colleagues, should I talk about Java Go, or about some container orchestration tool. And guess what they picked? The container orchestration thingy. <laughs> But I got some irritated messages, so I knew I was onto something. So here we are. Today I want to cover a small collection of topics I found interesting to wrap my head around on my journey to learn Go, coming from a Java background. So today I want to talk about likes, struggles, and take a closer look at topics like code organization, interface pollution, and return types. These are the topics I found the most interesting and appealing. Maybe some will surprise you, and I understand for others, these are the worst parts about the language. Go is very expressive, many say verbose. But I like how the amount of hidden magic is kept to minimum. We clearly can see this when we look at how air handling works. Um, there's no confusion about checked and unchecked exceptions and when to catch and, 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 and handle them. But instead, you always get an error, handle, error ha value back and you better do something with it. On top of that, there's a hidden benefit to the way error handling works because many functions give you error value as a second return value, you won't see a lot of method chaining in Go. My favorite missing feature is the lack of inheritance. <laughs> All the abstract classes and classic object-oriented examples how a dog is an animal and can therefore jump and eat and what, what else. 
and the exercises about dynamic binding have a special place in my heart. And this is not a complete list by any means. I know in the future there are more harder, more difficult topics coming up for me to conquer. Coming from a Java background with, with, with its omnipresent frameworks, I, I was missing some guidelines about how to structure my code. How many files should I create? Should I put every struct in its own file? How many packages do I need? Do I need packages? What are they? And such. And what I also miss, and you can be lazy because of that, I missed having some marking functionalities to write when, I, when I'm writing tests. I, I resolved this issue and turned it into a green light when I focused on um, proper integration testing using test containers instead. If you're not familiar with test containers, let me explain. They allow you to spin up a Docker container running an um, external dependency such as a database right within your tests, and this can upgrade your testing approach. And I trust that more than my own ability to write good mocks myself. So starting a new project can be overwhelming. As I said, it's hard to say how many files should I create, how should I organize my packages. And what I learned reading online is that it's to start small and simple, and the Go tool chain only knows one rule, and this is everything in, in, inside the internal folder is hidden from the outside world and not ex ex exported outside of the project. I think that's a reasonable starting point for small projects. And naturally, as a Java dev, I wanted to put everything in nicely cleaned up classes. So where are they? And coming from the object-oriented world, it could happen that you look at a struct and think, okay, this is a good replacement for a class. <laughs> uh, both of them are blueprints to create new instances and hold data, but that's mostly it. Um, struct have the advantage of being more lightweight, and by default, they don't contain behavior. But what about packages? Packages are the smallest unit of encapsulation in the language. The, com the Go compiler merges all the files within one package into one file anyway. So we can distribute our code as we need. You can hear me? As we need and optimize for readability. So what if we want to consider a class in a package, other way, what if we want to consider a package, a kind of a class in our heads? The standard library is the place to go to examples about how to name packages. We want them to be short, lowercase, and, and clear. For this example, I picked the local date time from Java and compared it to the time package in the Go standard library. And we can see both, both names, the class name and the package name, are used as the identifier. And we, they provide arms to, to create a new instance of them. OK, let's continue with what I got wrong about interfaces. When we start learning Go, we learn very early that interfaces are implicit here. But what does this mean? And then they tell you about duck typing. When it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it is a duck. duck. But what does this change for me as a developer? In textbook Java, it's very common to see to start the design by defining the interface first and then follow up with the implementation because the implementation is just an, an, an detail. Usually, then I add the classes with the implementation just next to it on the producer side. So you see here the example of a Java interface and next to it the implementation. And we call this putting the interface on the producer side. 
And since Go has interfaces, it's maybe likely we, we try to do the same. But what is, what is wrong with that? And the answer is inflexible design. What I failed to notice is that implicit interfaces are an invitation for to let your design evolve over time. In this example, we see a bakery which has all kinds of processes to do. But for me, as a simple client or consumer, I don't care about most of them. And in that case, I want the client or provide the client um, uh, an interface which is as specific to the use case as possible. Doing so helps us to applying the interface segregation principle of SOLID, which tells us that a client should never depend on methods it doesn't use. Let's continue with our last topic for the day. No pointers are copied by value. Seeing that comment, I was wondering, why is this wrong? And I'm the one committing that crime. And also, why Java doesn't offer me pointers? And to be honest, I was thinking, learn and go, that this is the first time I'm coming in touch with pointers. But as it turns out, this is not entirely true, because in Java, every time I was passing a non-primitive object to a method, I was passing a reference instead. And on top of that, there are methods or function with receivers. I'm not proud of it, but it took me quite a while to understand when to use a value receiver and when to use a pointer receiver. And I also feel stupid for the next slide, but I know some people might benefit of it. But if it's not for you, please be easy with me. This is a quick refresh about the syntax. We, we see a very simple method called cell. It takes one integer as a parameter. And what was the new twist for me is the part in the beginning. We see here a pointer receiver with the name B. And the pointer receiver is indicated by the asterisk. What helped me to understand what a receiver is, is to be reminded of what you really are. There are nothing else than a, a tidy way to separate the output parameter from our input parameters. So this alternative syntax results in the same. We it's like we can we can tidy up in, 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 in by by moving this input parameter to the front as a receiver. Back to the question of when we should use what type of of receiver. Again, we have here a little example. It was very simple bakery struct having a baguette counter. Below it, we saw, we see the previous cell method. And let's look at the main method. We initialize here a bakery with a counter of 10 and try to reduce the counter by one. <coughs> when we look at the value receiver, we see that the result isn't changed. Why is that? Because we use the copy and we pass the copy to the, to the self function. And we never changed the state of the bakery we created here. This is not expected and not good. Instead, when we use a pointer receiver, we see the, the output is changed as intended. What this tells us is that pointers allow us or give us the, the option for mutability. Here we have a table which could help us to decide which receiver to take. On the first row, we see the bakery example from before. Because we depend on mutability, we have to use a pointer. On the next row, we see the case when we want to pass a huge object to a function. Depending on the size, it could be good for the performance to use a pointer here. However, for new gophers like myself, the performance is most likely not the biggest issue of our code, and we should stick to readability and to the, the approach in the project instead. And on the f and the next row, we see the case, the scenario when we want to pass a value up object to a function. 
good examples or classic examples of op value objects are times, addresses, um, money transactions, dates, and such. And it's a good reminder or keep in mind that a value object loses its purpose when it's mutated. Therefore, therefore we should use a value here. To wrap this session up, I want to leave you with the following takeaways. Packages are important and, and deserve special care. Small interfaces make our lives easier. And we don't want to pass pointers to values, to, to, to functions. And also pointers give us mutability. Also, I want to point out how impressed I am of the GOM community. People are very passionate of what, about what they are doing, and, and a lot of So here I want to share some of the resources I used, and, and some of the books I, I used, and how impressed I am that there's so much available for free. Uh, in the center, you see my QR code to my link tree, which leads you to a feedback form and my social accounts. And if you want to give me a huge, uh, do me a huge favor, please give me your honest feedback. Thank you.